Hello and welcome to the Actualize Online Capstone Presentations. I want to welcome all the family and friends watching out on YouTube Live. My name is Brian Rice and I've been helping the presenters learn the fundamentals of full stack web development over the last 12 weeks. Each of them has learned a great deal about how to build an entire web app from scratch. And that's what they'll be showing you in just a few moments. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, Jay Wengro and Josh Sarna. Um, Jay is the founder and CEO of Actualize. Um, and he started the company by teaching one single cohort. And now he's CEO of um, a nice little company that we have here. Um, so uh, for both Jay and Josh, um, Jay, you can go first. Um, if you want to describe or say who you are, um, what you currently do, and an a piece of advice you'd have for a junior developer at their first job. Sure. Um, thank you, Brian. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this in a little direction first, like a politician. Um, and just, uh, so I'm Jay Munger, CEO of Actualize. Um, before I get into the piece of advice, I do want to thank everyone um, involved with uh, facilitating this cohort, um, starting with Brian, who is the lead instructor. He built himself as helping them, which is true, but he's also the lead instructor of this cohort um, and one of the architects of the actualized online format in particular. Um, want to thank the career advisors, Lisa and Alex, um, want to thank the TAs, Lauren and Bart, and also my co-panelist, Josh. Um, and thank you all for doing such a fantastic job leading this cohort. Um, in terms of a piece of advice, uh, there's definitely a lot to give, but I think one important thing to know is that there's so much to learn uh, in technology and what you'll ever learn is always just a small piece of it. So knowing that you always need to be continuing to learn more, um, also recognizing that it's totally normal that you always have to learn more. And uh, that's just part of the role. That's part of the role of a software developer is that you always keep on learning. Um, so always keeping that in mind. That's good advice. Um, <laughs> Josh, uh, what you're doing and piece of advice. Sure, yeah, so I'm Josh. Um, I'm working as a full stack developer at a shipping logistics company based in Madison, Wisconsin right now. Uh, been there a couple of years. A uh, piece of advice I'd give to a junior developer, um, whenever possible, read your coworkers code. Um, if you're a much more experienced coworker, write some code, opens a pull request, even if they don't ask for your feedback on it or anything, um, read their code. You might learn something about um, another way of doing something, uh, the programming language you're using, or just get a better familiarity with the, the app that you're all working on. So. Uh, don't don't pass up the opportunity to kind of mooch expertise like that. Also very good advice. Um, all right. Um, so first up, our first presenter will be Alex um, and his panelist will be Josh. Um, you can go ahead, Alex. Thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Alex. And my app is called Happy Hour. So my roommate likes cocktails. However, he only knows how to make one. So being the amazing roommate that I am, I thought I would give him some to reference, you know, so we can uh, make some more cocktails and enjoy them. So here we have the homepage. Uh, what are you in the mood for? So the point of this app is to just get new recipes, cocktails that you haven't had before, try something new. So on the homepage, you can get a list of recipes based on the types of alcohol. You can search by the ingredients you have on hand at your house or wherever. And you can also get a random recipe if you can't decide on something. So let's see here. We have uh, all these different types of alcohols and some explanations and histories behind them, how they started. Let's see. Say you want something with rum. 
So here it shows we have 104 recipes to choose for that are made with rum. So you can kind of go through those. We have the name and the instructions of the recipe just to kind of see what catches your eye, what sounds cool. Aztec punch, that sounds pretty cool. Let's check that out. So here we, so here we have the instructions again, and here we have some ingredients and then the measurements for ingredients. So you just follow the instructions and you can make your drink. Say if you like it, you could save it. Go to your favorites. Oh, I never logged in because you got, you got to be logged in to have favorites. So let me just log in really quick. All right. So I'll take you back to the home page. So I'm going to go back to my drink that I wanted to make. Sometimes it takes a little bit to load if you got a bunch of recipes here. Let's see Aztec Punch. I'm gonna save that. So now I'm gonna go back to my favorites. I already had some in here from before, Aztec Punch right here. But I actually, I didn't like this drink as much as I thought I did. So I'm gonna remove that because I don't want it again. So now here's some other options for us. So you can look up drinks by specific name. So let's say you want a margarita. Here we got, we got five margaritas to choose from. It's nice, you can try all five. You can also search by ingredients you have. So let's say I have cherries. And here I have autocomplete of all the ingredients that are in the database, which is nice to see exactly what you have. All right. So we got 33 rep recipes with those ingredients in them. So you can kind of take a look, see what catches your eye. And if you can't decide, we have a random button. Just keep clicking it till you find something cool. Apple pie with a crust, that sounds kind of good. Check that out, see if you like it or not. And that is my app. Thank you, Alex. Um, Josh, you can go ahead. Cool. Uh, Alex, this is very cool. Um, I like this app a lot. It's very smooth. Um, very cool idea. Can I ask where the data comes from? Yeah, so I got it from a cocktail database called Cocktail Database. And I see, I see, the, I see <laughs> all the data into, into, my, uh, into my database because it was the easiest. And uh, that's how I got it all. So it's all on my back end through a seeds file. Okay. Very cool. When you search for a couple of ingredients, does it find things that have both of those ingredients or is it just either or? Yeah. So at first when you search, um, it'll search, it'll uh, find everything with this ingredient and then this ingredient. And then I take out any duplicates. So there, there could be a recipe with both in there. Okay. Nice. Um, and then you said you made this for somebody who only knew how to make one cocktail. Uh, what cocktail? Uh, my roommate loves old fashions and that is the only thing he knows how to make. <laughs> Very cool. Um, well, I like this a lot. Nicely done. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alex. Um, next up, Amber and your panelist will be Jay. Thanks, Brian. Hi, my name's Amber. Do you have a passion for reading? Want a place where you can talk about fictional characters as if they are real and still seem sane? Then the Read Between community is the place for you. Now, if you don't have an account, do not despair. Simply go into the sign up, and voila, you can sign up. But because I already have an account, I'll simply head over to login, type in my information and password, and I'm in. Upcoming book discussions. Let's see what goodies are coming up. Oh, Dune's a classic. That's great. By Frank Herbert, who doesn't love Harry Potter. Ah, Minimum Wage Magic. I really like this book. Let's take a look. So you can see who it's hosted by, the event date and time, the meeting link. You can also see who's already participating. That's definitely gonna be a fun one. So I'm gonna go ahead and register. And there I am, I'm registered for the event. I'm super excited, so let's make sure everyone knows.
and now my comment's posted. You know, I've been reading this really good book. I'd love to see if they have an event coming up for it. So I can search by author or title. The author is Kenneth Thomas. Doesn't seem like they have it, no worries. I'll just go start my own discussion. So there's event information, book information. Fortunately, I can put in the ISBN 13 and it'll auto-populate a lot of the book information. Most of the stuff I can put later. So I'll go ahead, type in a name. Uh, I am prepared. I also want a book cover image, so I'll put that in. And I also come with the ISBN 13, so I'll pop that in as well. Let's go ahead and submit that. Oh, and there it is. There's my event. So I'll go ahead and click it. And all that information seems right. Yep, it's by Kenneth Thomas. And I can go ahead and update that information with an event date and time and meeting link at a later time. I'm super excited to see who's gonna register for this. Well, that's it. So it's as simple as that. Thanks for watching. And I hope you'll join our community because stories are always better when they're shared. Thank you, Amber. Um, Jay, go ahead. Hey, Amber, this is awesome. Um, I definitely appreciate uh, joining a club like this. Um, curious to know about that auto population by providing the ISBN number. How did you get that to work? Yeah, so I actually use the Google Books API. I was originally going to do the Goodreads one, but I think maybe a few days within choosing that, Brian mentioned that they had stopped they providing that API altogether. But oh. luckily, the, the Google API was much easier um, and streamlined to use. So it worked out fantastic. That's cool. Was, what would you say is the most difficult part of building this app? Uh, I would probably say, yeah, I, I would say the integration of the API, mm -hmm. um, getting, to, getting to know the API. Brian did such a great job in, in telling us how we get to dig into the API, but actually implementing it felt a little difficult. I, I definitely think I, I was wary at one point to see if I was even going to be able to do it. Um, but at the end, I, I did. And so, yeah, it was exciting that I was able to solve that issue. Yeah, and that's awesome. And because every API is different. So you have to really do that research. Uh, and it's a good feeling, right, when, it, when you get it to work. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. What, what, um, if you had more time, what other feature might you build into this? Uh, good question. I, I, there are so many things that I wanted to add. Uh, one of the big reasons why I did this was because I do actually have a book club that I've started mm -hmm. and I hate using Facebook for it. So I was like, what that kind of drove me to be like, what would I want? Um, so it'd be, a, it'd be kind of cool to also add um, a, the user who creates the event for them to see or their, like all the events they've created, all the users that have registered on their own page. Um, also kind of maybe add some more community built features, like a little bit more, um, a little bit more in depth work with like commenting and being able to respond and, and reply to comments and um, maybe have like a discussion page. Got it. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Um, those are all really great ideas. Um, this is a really nice app, Amber. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. Uh, next up is Andrew. Um, and your panelist will be Josh. Hey guys, I'm Andrew. Um, my application is built around the moon board. So for those of you who haven't rock climbed before, the moon board or climbing in general has two main categories, bouldering and ropes. Ropes is pretty self-explanatory, but bouldering, which is what my application is centered around, means short walls following colored holes. And each of those sequences of holes is called a boulder problem. So the grading system for rock climbing in general in America is the V scale, and it goes from zero to 17. But it's an open-ended system, meaning that the scale will continue to increase as the sport of bouldering progresses. Ultimately though, the numbers are subjective because they're dependent on your proportions and uh, strengths. So the moon board, it was first made by Ben Moon in 2016. And since then it's become very common across a lot of climbing gyms. 
Basically what it is though, is just a huge slab of wood with the same holds on every board. It's angled at 40 degrees. And because it's the same everywhere, it's an ideal benchmarking tool. Uh, on an actual moon board, you'll have LED lights underneath each of the holds that light up in um, RGB, red, green, red, or red, green, blue. But to emulate that on my application, I just have them in uh, colored borders. So on my create a problem screen, you'll see the board laid out like this. And you can start clicking right away if you'd like, and it'll begin with the starting holds. And you can switch to the middle holds as well as the finish hold. And the reason that I thought this would be cool is because a big part of the moon board is creating and sharing problems with other climbers. And there already exists an actual application for the official board, um, but I thought it'd be fun to try to recreate that. So after you've selected your holds, um, you can give it a name, you can give it a grade, but I already know that you're going to have to be logged in to submit it, so I'll go ahead and do that. So once I'm logged in, um, I can go ahead and select my holds, give it a name, and a grade. So on a moon board, because it's angled pretty steeply and the holds are fairly small, they all started at a minimum of grade four. And I did put a validation just so if you tried to, it would tell you it must be at least four. Um, but that's the reasoning behind that. So it's submitted, successfully created. And once I've done that, you'll be able to see it on the homepage at the bottom. So fun stuff. And if you click on the names, you'll be able to see your problem. Um, and the grade you submitted. And if you'd like to, you can use this plus button at the top to save it to a favorites list. And when you go over to your favorites, you'll be able to see it again. And if you happen to not like something in there, you can always remove that and it'll be gone when you refresh it. And on the home page, as well as the favorites, you probably noticed I have a search function. Um, it's pretty basic. It just does a dynamic search. And for the grades, I chose to do a drop down option just because uh, it may not always be super apparent what grades you can choose. So that's that. And that is my Moonboard application. Thank you, Andrew. Sorry for interrupting. Um, Josh, you can go ahead. Uh, Andrew, this is really cool. Um, Thank you. I really like the. Uh, the way you select um, what uh, what the problem is going to be or what pieces are involved in it. Can you talk about how you how you did that? I mean, yeah, um, it was actually a little funky to get started because we hadn't learned much about stuff like this in class, but it's basically just an HTML table going through an array full of empty strings. And when you click on one of the cells, it grabs the index and changes the border color of that element. So I have it set that when you toggle between the buttons, it'll do a different character, but it's transparent and you don't see it. And that's how it knows what color to change each of the holds. And then okay. once you've submitted it, it goes to the back end and then gets translated before it gets sent back. Very cool. That's some nice uh, responsive CSS. Um, Thank you. Yeah. What would you What would you add to this if you had more time? If I had more time, I would like to add a rating system where you would have ratings people could submit just so you know if it's like a sensible problem or not. Um, and I would also like to have thumbnails on the side just so that you could glance at what the problem is as you're going down. You don't have to click on each one. Um, and another one would be uh, nice to have like, uh, like a comments, I guess, just to see like, just curiosity, see what people thought about it. Okay. Very cool. Uh, what what grades do you climb? Um, I, on a moon board, can climb fives, but they're very difficult. Uh, it's not very consistent, to be honest. All right. Well, very cool. Uh, I love the application. Um, very nicely done. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrew. Um, next is Eddie, and your panelist will be Jay. You appear to be on mute, Eddie. I can, let's try this. Great, there you go. You hear me? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Eduardo Gutierrez, and this is Moodflix. Uh, so Moodflix is for when you're tired of, uh, you know, scrolling through those endless lists of, you know, movie titles on whatever streaming service you may be on. And you just, or maybe you're paralyzed by decision and you just need somebody to give you a few options and you can choose from. So that's what this is. So basically you can kind of just input here, whatever you want. So say I'm in to, I wanna watch a crime drama with um, heists and robberies. And so what I did is I used a couple different uh, APIs, I've used the um, IMDb API, uh, two different ones, and a uh, Google's natural language processing API, uh, specifically the entity analysis. Uh, what I did is I took uh, the plot summaries uh, from about 900 titles that I have in my back end, and I searched their plot summaries and I ran those through, natu uh, through Google's natural language processing, um, the entity analysis. And what I'm doing is I'm also using the natural language processing for the user's input as well. And so I'm matching all of the entities that it picks up from the user's input. Uh, and then I'm kind of searching through the titles in my back end and finding all the associated entities that are um, any of the ones that match that are in my back end. And so here's a selection of movies that uh, hopefully uh, match. And it seems to, seems to be matching. Um, so, that's Moodflix. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Jay, you can go ahead. Eddie, this is a great job. Um, I'm I'm definitely blown away by the complexity here. It's like all well, it's on the face of it, it seems like a simple app because it's all on one page, but obviously there's a lot going on. Well, first of all, did you make this background? The of uh, this I found this is from this gentleman here, okay. Steve Johnson. But the mood flex, is that a font? This is a font that I, uh, yeah, <laughs> I downloaded and, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Comic Sans move over. There's, there's mood flicks now. Um, <laughs> let's get into the, okay. So the natural language processing API, is that happening on the flyer? That's pre-processed. So that is pre-processed. I have an entities table. Uh, what I did is I, uh, ran each title ID, every unique title ID that I have in my back end. And I searched for the specific, uh, for one particular plot for each title. And then I ran the entity analysis on that. And then I took all of the entities associated with that and created an instance with a title ID. So each entity has a title ID and a type. So it's an entity name and it's type. What's an example of a type? The type could be anything from a person, a place, a thing, an event. But it's, it's basically a, a single word or a couple words? Correct. So in that sentence, like crime would be one, mm -hmm. uh, drama. I also ran the entity analysis on the genres. So mm -hmm. I also have that. So if anyone were to come in here and look for, I want to see a comedy or I want to see, you know, uh, anything like that, uh, the the entity analysis itself would pick out those those words and then search my back end for that. Got it. And the IMDB API is, is that so that's also part of the pre-processing? Is there any API call that ends up being live here? Uh, yes. So what you're seeing is an overview um, call. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm displaying. Uh, all the other information that I use to um, to gather the entities uh, is all through a separate um, call 
that was specifically for the plots of each title. Um, and I, this isn't a part that's in my, my, uh, my app now, but I also ran sentiment analysis and I have a sentiment score for each of the titles as well. So the reason it's called Mood Flicks is my original idea was try to have uh, kind of, uh, although I came to quickly find out that that's a very difficult thing to, <laughs> to uh, parse out and, um, and uh, link correctly. So right. that's, that's another feature there that hopefully I can continue to work on this and maybe um, at the end when I do have a good selection of titles, I can uh, then uh, order them uh, by sentiment. Very cool. Uh, Eddie, this is fantastic. Really nice job. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Next up is Emmanuel. Um, your panelist will be Josh. Cool, cool. Awesome. Well, welcome to Indie 365. So a little bit about Indie 365. Indy 365 is a statewide network that unites healthcare and human services organizations with a shared technology that enables a community and a person-centered approach for delivering care in Indiana. So pretty much the main purpose is the healthcare for like any need that or request that somebody's looking for, for health or any education services that are available for the state. Uh, a reason why I developed this app is my mom's a social worker and she says most of the time she just uses a phone number for clients to, uh, for calls for uh, healthcare needs. And there's no like web database in the state of Indiana with all this stuff located in one site. So uh, that's a good challenge for me and like see if I can fill, it, fill that out. Uh, so the first thing you notice is there, there's a requesting form to say somebody wants to request, they can fill out the form here. So we'll just put Tommy and then maybe do a gun maybe a boxer, uh, do we fill the email, fill the phone number, address, zip code, and city, and then the service type and service description. And then they can hit request. And then that will actually send out to the interface in the web and go to, based on their service, say they need adult education, tell me what some more adult education needs. They'll come back with a request for that. Uh, so the next uh, portion is all services. So you can go to the all service page. And once that loads, there will be a lovely map of Indianapolis. And then you can click on, you see the Christ uh, Church Cathedral at Marion County Food Pantry as the address where it's located at. Or maybe they wanna talk to or the Indianapolis Department of Parks and Rec. Uh, it's also Marion County Food Pantry for food services. Uh, so there's uh, also housing agencies if they need housing, affordable housing. There's a uh, John J. Barton Annex uh, apartment complex. They can go and look for and they also can search up here. So say they want Marion Food Services, they'll come up with Marion Food Services and they'll have a list of food services and maybe they want the city of Indianapolis as well. So the city of Indianapolis will come and show them their food services as well, based on that. They also can reset the search if they want to. So let's go back to the homepage. And also say, if you wanna be a service and wanna sign up for an internet network, you can sign up on the service page right here and you can sign up and fill there and then you can log in database. So let's see, we'll do Ted. And then once you're in, you can provide your spreader name. So maybe you do Project Lead the Way, maybe you do adult education, fill the address, fill in the name, the city, and then they can join from there. And then once they join the system, you can go back to the all service page. Let's just load this looking map. Let's see, we can go adult education, go to list, see Indianapolis. And there you go, project lead the way with all education services. And they can see that location. And that is my app. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, you. Josh, you can go ahead. Um, Emmanuel, really nicely done. Uh, I love that this meets a need that you identified. It wasn't just, you know, 
a thing that you thought of it actually <laughs> solves the problem. Um, that it looked like you were using Mapbox for your map. I was, yes, yep. Can you tell me a little bit about what integrating that was like? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, it was interesting. So I was, I had all the. Well, it was actually really crazy because I actually didn't have an API for this. I actually had to use uh, since any other didn't even have that in data. I had to use old uh, Excel sheets. So I actually railed uh, database those in CVS files and then parsed that into the actual my backend and then got the latitude longitude coordinates and uploaded those to Mapbox to get the actual data points uh, for the map. So. Actually, there's a lot more. I think I over. I think I did over like nine different services, and they're like over the state of Indiana, all these places where they can go and uh, search for and visit different depending on what service they need. So, importing that was uh, quite the uh, quite the challenge of getting all that in the, the data and fixing that to where it fixes is inside the uh, app. So, uh, yeah, it was a uh, it was quite the uh, challenge, but it was fun fun. Fun to learn about longitude and latitude and learning about different maps. Uh, I did I did find that uh, map boxes, uh, I think a little bit more user friendly. But Google AP Google's I was looking at that. That's I feel like that has a little more uh, a little more robustness. But it was a lot harder to like, implement based on what I had when I initially started with the CVS files. And map boxes is a lot easier to just get all this data in one set for me. So yeah, sure. And it seems like it worked. Um, always an adventure getting data yeah. not readily available in like an API or something. Yeah, that was quite the uh, challenge of putting that all together and seeing all those files in constantly. And then like I destroyed like, cause I was like, oh wait, I, the file structure is not the way I want it to be perfectly. So I had to like, I destroyed and like restarted and then like, okay, make sure everything <laughs> perfect for her. And I had to like, make sure like, cause some, sometimes the uh, smart sheets were different naming conventions. So I had to make sure naming conventions still matched based on what I was naming them. So yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the ability to send requests yeah. to so, services. How does that work? So my initial thing was actually, since it's actually the database, and my idea was to get with the, if the idea of the state of Indiana or the network would actually take the email, the person's email, and based on the service they need, would respond to send out a feeder to all the services that are available for that person in that area. Okay. They can come back with like, hey, this person needs this kind of service. Uh, and I actually wanted, if there was time, I actually wanted to build a, uh, uh, like a signature thing where they could sign. So to actually, when you really think about it, they actually probably need the signature somehow of that person to be able to offer them the service if they need it. Uh, so I did that into the request form, uh, possibly, yeah. Be nice, but yeah. That's the okay. idea behind the request form. Nice. Well, I really like this. Uh, really nicely done. It's very cool. Thank you. Next up is Aaron, and you can go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Um, so my app is called My Heart Failure Helper. I have a previous career in health care or in healthcare and um, heart failure patients were kind of my specialty during that time. Um, when you have heart failure, there is a lot of discipline and diet changes that are necessary. So this app is designed to be a tool for a user managing their heart failure from home. So the first thing I'll show you is the sign up button here. So the user can go ahead and sign up here. Here you can see a sodium limit. So a lot of heart failure patients have an amount of sodium that are they are limited to a day. So that is going to be integrated a little bit further on in the app, but that's kind of important to note. We'll go back to the original page and we'll go ahead and log in. Janice is going to log in. So this takes her right to her weight tracker. So this shows all of Janice's weights over the last seven days. Here you can see the date, and then here is her weight. And if you scroll down, you can go through and see the rest of her weights over the past seven days. Um, up here, you see a few more notifications. It shows her the difference in weight in the last two days. So she's gained zero pounds from yesterday. Um, however, her weight gain over the past seven days was five pounds. So it says to notify her provider immediately. However, Janice didn't really do that, so, and that's okay. 
She's gonna go down here and add a weight. She's gonna get on the scale at home. And today, this morning, she weighed 210 pounds. She'll select today and submit. And here you can see that it's been updated. Here's her weight for today. She has some new notifications. Now her weight gain in 24 hours is two pounds. So it's saying to notify her provider immediately. And then her weight gain in the past seven days is seven pounds. So she goes ahead and notifies her provider. They tell her maybe take your water pill and look at your sodium intake for the past few days. So she'll go up here, go to her sodium tracker. Now this will show her all of her sodium information for a day of the week. So let's go ahead and look at her sodium from yesterday. So here you can see that she consumed 2,500 milligrams of sodium, um, but the difference is a little over a thousand. So she's had a little over a thousand more than she should based on her limit numbers. So too much salt. Here she can see her entries for the day. So she's got breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, Janice kind of thinks back, oh, what did I have for breakfast? She kind of remembers, oh yeah, I went to Bojangles and got that chicken biscuit. That was probably a bad idea. That was 1900 milligrams of sodium. Not a good idea to do. Um, so she's kind of bummed about that, but she's thinking about what she can eat today that will kind of lessen that. So she can go here to her sodium calculator and this will allow her to enter any sort of food that she wants to eat and it will give her back what sodium she wants. Um, so she, her friend Brian always mentions this stuff. He calls it quinoa, thinks it's really good and healthy. So she's gonna see how much sodium's in that. Let's try one cup of quinoa. Eight milligrams of sodium, that's pretty good. Kanoa sounds good for breakfast. So she's gonna go back to her, um, to add her sodium on this page. One cup of quinoa, oops. She doesn't quite remember how much sodium it said was in there, but that's okay. She can leave this blank because it will, the app will allow her to, will introduce it right into it. So. Here's today, add sodium amount. See the information for today. And you can see she's only consumed eight milligrams of sodium so far today. Keep up the good work. So now she is gonna go ahead and log out and she is done for the day. That's my answer. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Um, you can go ahead, Jay. Hey, Aaron, this is a really valuable app and really well done. Um, I'd love to hear about how that sodium calculator works. Like, how does it tell how much uh, sodium there is in a cup of quinoa? Yeah, so I used um, a nutrition a API for that called Edamom. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives the nutrition for everything, and I just pulled out it to allow sodium for whatever the user inputs. Got it. So you provide the API both like the food and a measurement? Exactly. Yeah. For that API, you have to do the food, the quantity, and kind of a description of the food in a way. Got it. Like the size of the food. Does it take like different types of, so I know you put in a cup, but does it take like teaspoon or does it also it like does. ounces and grams? and? Yeah, all of that. It also does size. So you can say like one large apple or one... Oh small yeah it's it's flexible yeah cool um what was your favorite aspect of building this app probably integrating the api it was kind of challenging but finally getting it to work was very rewarding um i have it so it saves to the database but then um one of the other features is that it will just show it to the patient or to the user as well got it that's very good. I love when I hear that the most challenging part was also the most enjoyable or rewarding part. It's a definitely great thing. A good sign. Yeah, it's always fun when you get it to work. Yeah. <laughs> Frustrating, but then 
very rewarding at the end. Very cool. Um, well, I hope you put this out there so people can, uh, you know, take care of their health better. Thank you. Um, really nice to have Aaron. Congrats. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Um, next up is Jimmy. Um, Jimmy, your panelist will be Josh. Okay. Just one moment here. All right. Hello, my name is Jimmy Johnson, and this is my app, which I've named Senate Seed Race. Um, to start, I'm going to go up and sign up. So go to the sign up page. Over at the bottom, I'll put in my name. Um, funny thing, I'm going to get my uh, put enter this name, which is a name that as a kid I was constantly reminded of. Um, because in the Dominican Republic, they like to associate themselves with famous people. And Jim, the only person with the name Jimmy was Jimmy Carter for them. So put that in. So put that in, put the password. Once you put in the password, it should take you to the login page. And the password. Okay. And to introduce you to Senate Seed Race, um, I really want to take um, a simple approach and uh, build a a website that where people could um, get familiar with the candidates that were run, running for Senate um, in Georgia. I felt that it, uh, considering our, our polit political environment, it's very important for people to get familiar for uh, with who they are voting for instead of just um, voting for who is who they align with politically in terms of party. So over here um, on the landing page, um, the users would get introduced to the candidates. Um, starting off with the two Democratic candidates, uh, one of them being John Ossoff, uh, Raphael Warnock for the Democratic candidates, and the, the Republican incumbents, Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. So if you go ahead and click on one of their images, it would take you to their personal page, which would introduce you a little further to the candidates themselves. See a little um, biography on them and some more information and also some particular issues that have, we've um, lined up here and the uh, candidate stances. And towards the bottom, you'll have two links, one so you can send a message directly to the candidate and also another link uh, uh, sending you to the Georgia websites for you to register to vote. And that is my app. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, Josh, you can go ahead. uh jimmy carter very nice app obviously very relevant right now um how do you see this app um being used outside of the election season uh for senate uh or even so, just outside of this election now that georgia's decided mm -hmm. so the idea behind this is that um with the upcoming uh elections for senate um another um public office um, elections. Uh, I will be updating um, the candidates in my database. Um, that's the idea I have to, you know, have it stay relevant. Okay. Uh, where does the data come from? Did you? Uh, so all of my data I've uh, entered in the back end. Okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, if you go back to the homepage, um, you can um, oh, um, you can uh, visit another page, and again, all of it is being uh, pulled from the back end. Okay, very cool. Um, you mentioned being able to contact uh, senators and um, candidates. How does yes. that work? Uh, so it's a, a contact form that 
where you can uh, directly just put in your name, your email, enter a subject and uh, what's on your mind, mind just so you can uh, have uh, some communication with the candidates and let them know if there's um, any other issues or concerns that you have that you would like them to address. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, does this actually send a message or is it? Uh, that's Just something internal? I, uh, it's internal. I did something I didn't uh, get quite around um, to getting to work, but something okay. I will be developing in the, when I, uh, right after this. Cool. Uh, well, I like this a lot. Obviously it's a super important thing. Um, providing more information about candidates is always a good thing. Um, very nicely done. Uh, I like the humor as well. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next up is Shane. Shane, your panelist will be Jay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Shane, and this is Workout Caddy. Um, being a personal trainer and training many people different, uh, many di uh, many different people over the years, um, I noticed that many struggle with creating a workout. Um, for many, it's overwhelming to think about all the exercises and try to handpick which one is going to create an effective workout. This is where the app Workout Caddy comes in. Just like a caddy for golf, it's there when you need it and when you need some guidance. So let's take a peek. We're going to help one of my fellow or my older clients come up with a good workout today. He was kind enough to give us his login information. So we'll kind of go through that. We got his email in here, his selected password. So we'll log on in. Perfect. Once we're here, we're at the home page. Going to show you kind of a big list of our community exercises. So this is a dynamic list of exercises. Every time someone creates an exercise and adds it, it's going to the ever-growing list of all of our community exercises. So every time you sign in, there'll be new exercises to choose from. So since it's Wednesday, Arnie wants to do a full body workout. If it was Monday, we'd be doing chest, but now we're doing full body. So he wants to start his workout with his legs. So we can use a search bar, look for exercises that just include the legs. We got a variety to choose from, but he expressed to me that really he likes to do some barbell squats. We're gonna add that to the workout. So we got the legs down. Might as well do some big back exercises as well. Give the legs a break for a little bit. We'll work the back out. So Arnie, he's not really interested in doing any bent over rows or renegade rows. He wants to do a heavy lift. So he's getting the deadlift. He's gonna incorporate that to his workout. Then he's gonna get the chest going a little bit. Arnold loves to do these landmine presses. So we'll add that, let him have a little fun with it. Let's take a peek, maybe do some arms after that. We got the big muscles out of the way. Time to kind of tone up with the arms. We're gonna do his all time favorite, the Arnold presses. Definitely add that one. And we're gonna polish this workout off with a great core exercise. Burn it out, get the core, getting ready for summer. Taking a look at all the exercises, we got a lot to choose from. Um, for him, he's gonna do the static bear hold. It's classic, why not? So what we're gonna do is review the exercises or actually our workout. So we'll click our created workout. It's gonna bring us to my workout. It's gonna display large pictures that you can always review back in case you need help with form or just remembering the workout in general. So we'll go through it, make sure everything's there. We got the deadlift, we got the squat, the landmine press, the Arnold's and the bear. Looks like everything's there, but he forgot one thing. He didn't see it on the list. So he wants to add an exercise. So he's gonna create one, really wants those triceps popping through his shirt. So he's gonna do some skull crushers. He'll type that in, primary focus. What we're gonna do is work the arms on this one. So we'll add that. And then we'll look online for a picture found one earlier, demonstrates the exercise perfectly. So we'll add that below, create the exercise, and then we are here. So now we can utilize the search menu again, look for arms, see which one we just made. Skull crushers, perfect. Add that to the workout. Let's review the workout once more, make sure everything's looking good. Should be added at the bottom, and it is. Awesome, we're good to go. Gave this to Arnie, he loved the workout. So he wants to actually save this and do it next time. So he's just gonna log out. Next time he's at the gym, he'll sign back in.
Now we got a little bit of making sure he signs back in with the right username. Perfect. Once he's back in, he can just go back to his created workout, review it again. This time he kind of twisted his ankle over the weekend, so he won't be doing any barbell squats. So he'll remove that and just kind of utilize the rest of the workout. Next time he wants to start fresh, what he's going to do, remove everything, start over, create a new workout, do whatever he's got to do. That's workout caddy. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Shane. Um, Jay, you can go ahead. Hey, Shane, this is super useful. Um, it seems like there's a lot of data, right, going on. Like you have a workout that has many exercises and then exercises also sort of stand alone and you have to, you know, associate these things based on the body parts, the arms and back, et cetera. Uh, was that complex to tie that all together or is it yeah. easier than I think it, it looks like? <laughs> it, it, was, it was definitely tough. It was basically creating like a shopping cart and adding items to that shopping cart and then basically mm -hmm. adding that to your, your cart. So basically real similar to what you do when you're shopping online but we're using exercises. So what we did is just kind of, like you said, select a series of exercises, shift them over to like the cart. And then what we would do is just display the cart, which would be the full entire workout. Yeah, I like that shopping cart analogy. I never thought about it like that. Um, cool, what else would you add to this in the future? So definitely I'd love to make it a little bit more dynamic with some social aspects, adding friends, sharing workouts, um, an option to delete exercises if you created that own exercise. Mm -hmm. So those are a few things I'm looking to add in as soon as we, I can. Um, just making it a little bit more social, a little bit more interactive between users of the application. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, did you enjoy the doing the front end or back end of this app more? So um, I, my favorite part was actually tying it all together. Um, mm -hmm. I got the front end going good. Um, we practiced on the front, uh, the back end was good, practiced the front end a little bit, but the first day or two was a little bit kind of uh, chaos in my mind, trying to <laughs> associate where everything was going. But after the third or fourth day, everything kind of slowed down and I was able to really get things done. So um, just getting time with the app was, was really crucial for me. Got it. And you're able to wire it all together. Yep. Uh, well, you did a really nice job with that. Uh, congrats, Shane. Really impressive. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shane. Um, last up tonight will be Tyler. Uh, Tyler, your panelist will be Josh. Thanks, Brian. All right. Okay, so my app is called Round Robin. What is Round Robin? Round Robin is an app that allows you to log the books that you've read, are currently reading, or want to read, and then rate them. So in Round Robin, you can create a book log by inputting the title of the book and author. Mark books as want to read, currently reading, or read. And after a book is read, you can give that book a one to five star rating. So to start, let's sign up. So. Okay, submit. Oh, okay, we got an error here. Password must contain at least one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter, one number, one special character. So redo that. Okay, so now he's signed up and we will log in. Okay, so from here it brings you to the book page. Here's a list of books that are already on the page. Um, so yeah, he wants to read Dune, so we'll add want to read. And now that's on his profile with a status of want to read. He doesn't have a rating yet. But then if he wants to add his own books that he wants to read or has read, he can add that to his log. So we have uh, 
Okay, so from there, we can create that. And then that's down at the bottom. So now he's already read this book, he loves it. He's going to create that book. And now that's on his profile. Then from there, he's started to read Dune. So can mark that as currently reading, update that. And updates on the page to currently reading. And from there, he's read it, thought it was great, five stars, update. But then if there's a book that you add to the page that you don't like, just say, you know, he read it, he didn't really think it was that great, you can always delete it. So then it's deleted, it's off his profile. So that is Round Robin, the book app. Thank you, Tyler. Um, Josh, you can go ahead. Uh, Tyler, I like this a lot. Uh, I'm a big reader, so this is super interesting. Um, what was the hardest part in building this? Um, so originally this app was going to be something completely different. I also was going to use the Goodreads API and it was going to use OAuth and allow you to log in to your Goodreads, access your friends list, access your you know bookshelf. And then from there, you would have been able to create a book club. And yeah, that was, that was the idea. And just like with Amber's experience uh, two days before going to start, um, got removed, but that was also probably the best experience too, because it was a real life teacher. So nice. Um, yeah. Dealing with other people's data is always, always a risk. So, uh, really nice that you're coming out of it, looking at, at as a lesson. Um, what, uh, what made you choose the name round Robin? What is that? Uh, so like in school, um, there's a bunch of different terms for like when you're popcorn reading, that's one, uh, round Robin reading is another one. So I decided to go with something that I associated with reading. All right. Um, do you have any book recommendations for me? I do. Um, depends. What type of, uh, what type of books do you like? Anything fiction. Anything fiction. Okay. This is probably one of my favorite books, Dawn of Wonder by Jonathan Renshaw. So. All right. Uh, what would you add to this? Um, other than, you know, putting Goodreads API back online. Um, I would definitely try and integrate um, the Google books API. Um, I had originally tried to do that, but just, wasn't working so i opted to well wasn't i couldn't get it to work rather so i opted to um you know work on a few other features um like in the sign up i did a pop-up if you had the wrong password validation and also did password validation but yeah i would definitely try and integrate um the google books api okay well very cool uh thank you tyler i'm gonna read Dawn of Wonder. Uh, appreciate you sharing this app. Awesome. Thank you. He's actually going to read it too. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to Jay, Josh, Lisa, Bart, Lauren, and most of all, to all the presenters. Um, I would say all your names, but that's too many names in a row to say. Um, thank you so much for all the hard work you've done. Um, everyone did a great job. Um, so we will be signing off and we'll see you all next time.